here we're in the Belvedere courtyard, and here's this massive head of, who oh, I don't know, is that Constantine or one of the emperors? There is the upper bit of the Belvedere courtyard with that massive bronze pine cone, of which I don't have a photograph probably because there were tourists leaning against it when I was there. In order not to give us no idea of what the whole place looks like, I've dug out this wonderful book published in 1880-something. The author of it really had been dead for about 30 years, and his name was Letarouille, and he was a Frenchman who was a pupil of Percier Fontaine. After he was dead, this was published, which has all these wonderful line engravings of the Vatican. Um, so here's the great staircase by Bernini, and that wonderful sculpture on the right, I think is the one in my photo here, um, and I always love that enormous, I think it's marble curtain. It's that great big baroque curtain, half hiding, half revealing that niche that it's in. Um, and apart from that, the only photograph I'm going to show you of general scenes are this, you know, with two shafts of light in St. Peter's. It's a fantastic space, but of course it is always full of those people with bright coloured clothes down the bottom of that picture. So I think we'll leave those contemporary photographs showing people and go back to Leterui's wonderful engravings. And now this is the Hall of the Animals in the Museo Pio Clementino. This is one of my favourite rooms in the museum. I thought they were all ancient Roman animal sculptures. In fact, a few of them apparently were brand new in sort of 1780 when the museum was put together. And they are incredibly lifelike. And I think a lot of them are ancient, a lot of them are Roman. And they're from the age of imperial Rome. They decorated people's houses. Look at this. I'm terrifying, isn't it? I mean, they are extraordinary. And they're so sort of kitsch. And they're quite sort of shocking when you first see them. Because you'd think of Roman sculpture as being terribly chaste and, you know, copying Greek things and dignified. And, and suddenly there's all this very sentimental animal stuff going on. I love that deer prancing. And then, of course, they always have to have these tree stumps and things holding them up. The stones they're made of are extraordinary. A carved crab, incredibly lifelike, but in a green porphyry or something, and, and sitting on a sort of bed of seaweed carved out of white marble. And then this, you see, of course, I, I thought, oh, well, it's obviously ancient Roman, you know. But of course it's not, because it's a jaguar, and they never knew about jaguars, because they, they lived in South America. And I like the hair or whatever it is hanging from a tree on the left, those spots of inlaid bits of marble into this wonderful onyx. I think this might be the Hall of the Muses. That is one of the muses on the right, isn't it, holding her lyre or harp? I think that's probably a muse, but I'm not sure. And really, I should, I, should, I should know, shouldn't I? Otherwise, I shouldn't really be showing you the pictures. That, I think, is another of the muses, isn't it? The one who's concerned with astronomy. Sitting against, you see, a, a fresco removed from a Roman villa somewhere. And then look at this guy carved out of porphyry, I suppose. There are just rooms and rooms and rooms and shelves of these things. And some of these obviously have got, you know, Roman heads and then baroque um, marble cloaks on them that have been added. And this, this whole room, those shelves were probably done in the 1890s, aren't they? Look at that column of, what is that stone? Is that serpentine or something? And, and with that extraordinary vase on top. It is an absolute trip, this place. It's incredible. And this very strange object, I can't remember what it is, but it's, you know, it's a lifelike representation of something, and you can't really tell from this angle. But I just love the colours of the stones together, and it's sitting on a bit of porphyry at the bottom, which is obviously always a good thing, isn't it? And then here's somebody's thigh. Is this another of the muses? Who knows? And some rather wonderful wall decoration things. And look at this lion. Isn't he fantastic, carved out of that amazing marble? I mean, this must be Roman, mustn't it? But maybe not. So it's a dolphin being attacked by a rather savage sea serpent that's biting its fin. And you can see the light coming through the, the fin because it's so thin, uh -huh, um, carved out of some sort of onyx or something. And on this bed of a rippling sea. And then down the bottom, you see the, 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 the Pope has had engraved into it, you know, that it's the munificent gift of Sextus. Some sort of cat, isn't it, who's been ripping apart a sheep. Very bloodthirsty composition, but look how beautifully the sheep's fleece is carved. And then here a pelican, is it, or a crane or something is having a go at a frog. And then here a very lifelike sort of, I suppose that's a griffin, isn't it? 
mythological creature. And then this is the hall of the torso. German art students were always hanging out in the Vatican Museums drawing things. I bet that's a German art student with a cloak on. And then the, look at the guard, isn't he splendid? He's sort of one of the Swiss guards who's there guarding the sculptures at that stage. You didn't get Swiss guards in there now. But here is the torso when I took a photograph of it. And it is fantastic, that torso. But of course, I've had to cro crop in very tight in order to crop out the tourists. Or well, my fellow tourists, I should say, I suppose. Then this is the great round hall. On the right in the niche there is this famous bronze Hercules, gilded bronze, and, and was found in Rome somewhere in the sort of 1860s. And I think he'd been struck by lightning in ancient times. And so because he'd been struck by lightning and I suppose cast to the ground, then he had to be buried with a freshly killed lamb, I suppose, to feed him and send him on his way. It's rather fascinating, isn't it? But anyway, he was dug up in the 1860s, and there he is, marvellous, with his lion skin, as he draped over his arm, of course, and his club. And then next to him is Antinous, the Emperor Hadrian's boyfriend, his great love, who unfortunately fell into the River Nile, didn't he, and drowned. Here's our German art student. He's having a good time sketching these incredible porphyry sarcophagi. Are they sort of 250 AD or something? Late Roman imperial time. Completely unbelievable, those things. I mean, they are the biggest blocks of porphyry you'll ever see. And, and with these incredibly deep carvings on them, and these sort of heads popping out of the stone, they are just absolutely unbelievable things. And they're held up, you see, by these very lifelike animals. You can see there's some animal there just turning its head to sort of slightly grimace at the kind of babies in vine or whatever's going on on the side of it. There's one of the babies. Just fantastic. And, and so that one is, is there on the left, more of our art students. And, and there's the entrance today with those Egyptian figures holding up the portal. Which I suppose they're actually made in 1780 or something. But this guy is obviously old and carved from a fantastic sort of granite. Look at the delicacy with which they've carved those. Bowl made out of leaves, carved out of marble. It's fantastic. And then this is the gallery of the candelabra. And this is actually my favourite bit, really. Because it's just full of all these vases and candelabra and small sculptures, all in these different stones. Look at that stone, isn't that fantastic? Of course, I've always gone around thinking that they're all ancient Rome and from Imperial Rome, and probably they're not really. You know, let, let, let's pretend they are more sculptures in there. And somebody's foot, sort of booty with a lion skin. Maybe it was a Hercules' foot. Fantastic handle that's done as these twisted branches tied with ribbons. Another of these, a sort of very bacchic one covered in vines. And then here a sort of square tatsa carved out of some fantastic stone. It's so delicate. This has always been put together completely wrong, hasn't it? I mean, that dish on top couldn't possibly be the original thing for the legs. It's much too small. This is a, a, a column capital, I suppose, which is a lion skin. It's Hercules' lion skin. Endless, endless vases on pedestals. Wonderful. But I love the inlaid eyes, too. And another fantastic looking sandal. And this is obviously enormous, this foot. Which one can't really tell from the photograph. I should have included part of a tourist. A discreet little slab of porphyry that's holding up that grey granite one. Really wonderful. Egyptian alabaster, I suppose. And here another. Marvellous. And look at this ram's head, so the handle on an urn. And there's a fantastic candelabra on the right there. Look at that thing. So delicate. And this is one of my favourites. I mean, that stone is just incredible, isn't it? Some sort of onyx or something. I mean, it's just amazing. And maybe some are made in the 18th century from bits of old extinct marble. I don't know. I wish I did know. And then here's just a sort of very attractive young boy, I'm afraid. Cardinal's taste, I suppose we could call that. Another bird in the gallery of the maps. I've got almost no photographs of the rest of the Vatican, I'm afraid, because... Very difficult to take pictures in there, really, without crowds of people. And out of the window of the Gallery of the Maps, you can just see the wonderful Casino Pio, which is this incredible little Renaissance villa in the garden, in the Pope's garden. Wouldn't it be wonderful to go there? We can only go by looking 
here in Monsieur Leterrui's engravings. And this one's rather fun with the, the Pope having a quick wander through his garden, shaded by a parasol and blessing a couple of devout peasants on the left. The casino itself on the right in the background, that's the Dome of St. Peter's. And then back in the museum, octagonal court in the background there, I will zoom in. And there is the most famous object in the museum, of course, which is the Laocoon. In 1506, Pope Julius receives word that something has been found in this man's vineyard. He sends Sangallo, the architect, and so Sangallo and his son go with somebody called Michelangelo, who was, I think, staying in the house. And so the three of them go off to the man's vineyard and they dig up this thing, because I suppose he'd found the top of the head or something, and they dig it up and have a look. Sangallo's son writes later in his sort of memoirs that supposedly his father, as they were unearthing, it, said, oh, well, of course, this is you know, the famous thing that's written about in Pliny. And in Pliny, there's a description of the sculpture that supposedly was, was in the palace of the Emperor Titus. But there's my picture of it. And it is the most extraordinary, amazing, amazing object. Sort of rather upsetting, I suppose, in a way, isn't it? It's a Trojan priest and his two sons, and they're being sort of strangled and bitten to death by the sea serpents that are sent by Poseidon because the priest sort of offended the god Poseidon in some way during the Trojan Wars. It's something to do with the Trojan horse. But there it is today. And then here it is, as it was first arranged in the Vatican, before they'd made a replacement arm. Here's Tadeo Zucaro sketching the Laocon in the courtyard in 1520 or something, and drawn by his brother. And his brother did this series of wonderful drawings of Tadeo Zucaro and his early life in Rome. They're rather beautiful. And they're all in this weird format because it was meant to be part of the decoration of a room in the extremely fancy sort of, you know, showroom home. And then the Laocon was so famous that obviously Napoleon carted it off to Paris. And so here it is on a Sèvres vase. And, and here it is set up at the Louvre with Napoleon visiting at night. And so it's being lit up for them. Isn't that fantastic? I wonder how those lamps worked. I suppose the guys would move the lamps and it would animate the sculpture in a wonderful way. And rather like a lot of sculptures at that time, you know, would be put on rotating pedestals so that you could turn them round. And I think a lot of sculpture viewing at night, so that as you turned them, the shadows moved and the sculpture came to life, as it were. Here he is back in the Vatican with his restored arm. And so that upstretched arm is, is completely wrong. It's all these, all these arms were, were then removed. And in 1906, they found what they think is the real arm in a builder's yard in Rome, <laughs> which is a fantastic place to find an arm. And, and, and so it obviously, you know, had gone through the wars and I suppose didn't have the same sort of restoration done to it as the rest of the sculpture. So you can slightly see, you know, how the rest of the sculpture would probably look today if it hadn't been probably polished up by somebody. There's one of the sons without his fake arm. It's been removed. And then I've got just a few pictures of the Raphael rooms in Julius II's apartment. And there's, there's, there's his Della Rovere oak tree crest over the window. There he is being carried in. But what I love is, is the gold, gilded bosses on the ceiling. Don't they look fantastic? And um, here he is again being carried in. And this is just a, a carved wooden shutter and the floor. Isn't that fantastic? And here's a lovely bit of grisai. And this is just the ceiling in one of those rooms. And obviously, lots of babies doing stuff. But look at that floor, isn't it wonderful? And it's been sitting there so long that it's all the stones are worn smooth. And they're like cushions. And there's a window reveal. And here's one of the muses in the Borgia Pope's apartment downstairs. The father of Lucrezia and Cesare Borgia. And, and there's his Borgia bull. And those are actually really, really beautiful rooms. They're much emptier, of course, because people don't know anything about them. So they rush through them to get onto the Sistine Chapel. And there's the ceiling in there, very beautiful. 